So you guys, everybody knows the agent offers type form, correct? To submit an initial offer and how that works. Traditionally, that's all we've really used that for is listing offers and, and off agent offers. But Kyle and Jacqueline in the meantime have gone and really beefed it up for all of our responses now, like requests for repairs, contingency removals, addendums, all of that is now available on that agent offers form. So you're able to do everything you want. So no longer will we having to be emailing people in the middle of the night or anything like that. Like, Hey, can you do this? The new plan that is being implemented is that we're going to start having coverage and correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, seven days a week from 8 AM to 10 PM, it's all going to be on the same board. So, and, and so you don't have to email multiple people to try to get a hold of somebody. If you go to that agent offers form, if you need an acceptance, agent offers go to acceptance. I need a contingency removal, agent offers contingency removal. Request for repair or counter to request for repair, anything like that will all be through there. It'll all go to the source that's gonna be doing it for you. So now it's been consolidated, cleaned up, and one place to get everything done that you may need and it's all going to be prompting you along the way to make it super easy for you. Any overarching questions on that before we start this presentation? Playing it with it earlier today, and it looked it's pretty slick. It's pretty, it's super easy. And I just did my first contingency removal with it, and it was smooth as hell. So pretty awesome. Excited about it. Perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. If you haven't met me, I'm Jacqueline, and uh, I handle transactions for the team. So we are going to go over today what happens once you get your clients into contract. So the whole process from actual accepting of the contract until they have keys in hand. First thing that happens whenever you go under contract, uh, first thing you're going to do is you're going to hop on Typeform and send in the, uh, the Typeform to let us know that you're under contract. And it's going to ask you some of the details of it, of things like if they want to get an answer inspections like who the title's with. It's just going to it'll walk you through all the different questions. So you're going to fill that out. And then you're also going to send an email to uh, into team at uh, C2 Realty and uh, myself and send over the contract that you have uh, with all of the signatures, any addendums that's with it. So that way uh, we can get that started and get it out to all the different parties, uh, the agent on the other side, the lender, the title company, um, just getting everyone on the same page. And uh, so getting that done the day that it's actually accepted is really important. If it gets accepted late at night, just first thing the next day. So your steps to do or what your clients are going to be expecting to do in those first few days, those are, you know, all the days are really important, but uh, the first few days are uh, really time sensitive. So they need to get their earnest money in and that's going to get sent to uh, the, uh, or dropped off a title company, or it's going to be a wire to the title company. It'll go directly from your buyer to title. The amount on it is on the contract. Uh, it does not change. The other thing to note about earnest money is um, in order for a contract to be effective, um, it has to actually have an earnest money. We can't have a contract that has zero earnest money. Um, so that's just good to know whenever you are uh, writing your offers. The other thing that you'll be responsible for in those first few days is scheduling any of the inspections that your buyer is interested in doing. So like home uh, and pest are the big ones that are the most common ones. Um, so getting those scheduled, uh, ideally that first day, if you can get them scheduled, because sometimes it just takes time for, to get the inspectors out there. And then uh, other thing is, so the, all the documents to the lender, that's going to be a reminder for your buyer uh, to get any documents, uh, any you know financial documents that the lender is requesting, getting those to them uh, first thing. And final thing to note is uh, just a friendly reminder to your buyer to buy nothing during the whole uh, transaction process until we are actually closed and they have keys in hand, tell them, do not go out and buy furniture. Don't go buy a couch. Don't go get a refrigerator. Like they're really excited about their new house, but it can mess up their credit. It's not about the fact that like their credit score will drop a bunch. I mean, that's part of it, but it can change their like debt to income ratios. So um, nothing, buy nothing until they have keys in hand. 
I wanted to touch base on a couple of things with that. Specifically, when you get that introductory email, you're going to have your offer in hand and you're sending it over to the agent on the other side. Super important to let everyone know, and especially in the first three days, introduce all the parties and tell them to keep the other party CC. I make a point of saying, please email team address on all emails in the first several. And if they don't include them, I make sure to do that because I'm not the one handling everything. I need my team CC. So I clearly stipulate, please CC team on all future correspondence. That's a really big point moving forward. In terms of the EMD, you need to let the clients know that they're going to be getting wire instructions to pay that EMD within three business days of going into escrow. So that you need to give them a heads up, hey, just be on the lookout for that. Now, a lot of the times escrow is going to try to send the wire instructions to you directly. I typically want to get myself out of the middleman communication between myself and escrow. I specifically go right back to them and say, here's my client's contact information. Please send it to them directly. Do not put yourself as the middleman of communication between escrow and your clients because escrow will take advantage of it and you just it's just going to bog the process down completely. Inspections, to Jacqueline's point, some inspectors get booked out super fast. So if you know you're going to get a certain inspection, book them almost immediately, especially if you have a short contingency window. Home inspection. That is like the general practitioner doctor, right? They're going to go take an overall look at you and say that healthy, 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 healthy. But if they notice your eyes are wrong, they're not going to diagnose it. They're going to spend you, send you to an eye specialist to diagnose it. That's like a lot of other things. Now, a pest inspection, that is a specialist, but that is standard on almost every single home inspection. But like a roof inspection, you don't necessarily by default hire a roof inspection unless the home inspector calls for it. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind or your clients call for it. Sewer inspections, they're required in some cities, not required in others. Generally a good idea to do, but it's a 50-50. It's not necessarily standard. Typically in, the, in regards to inspections, other than the home and pest inspections, don't automatically book them unless they're requested by your client or requested by the home inspector. So general rule of thumb. All right. So just so you know, so this has, you know, the days listed on there. So we had like uh, day zero to day three for earnest money and getting inspections. Uh, and then this says seven to 17 days. So these are all happening at the same time. It's not, you know, your physical contingency doesn't, uh, they don't stack on top of each other. So, you know, uh, appraisal, lend, uh, loan and physical contingencies are all happening simultaneously. So again, back to the fact that time is of the essence, especially at the beginning. So during those inspection appointments, there is a form that needs to be completed by you, uh, the agent, regardless if you have the buyer or seller. If you have the seller, you would do it earlier. But for all of your buyer contracts, a really good time to get your AVID done is when the inspections are happening, when you go out there to meet with the inspector toward the end of the inspections. And it's just you walking around and noting anything about the property that is not in uh, working order. Um, if there's, you know, if there's scuffs on the mall on the wall, if there's a stain on the carpet or something's broken, glass is broken, things like that. You're just making observations and putting it on there. Second thing is we're gonna get a large packet of disclosure sent over from the listing agent. And uh, so it, it's about 200 pages. It's a lot of things. Frankly, about 180 of those pages are very standard forms that happen on every transaction. Uh, they're calculated. California documents talking about earthquakes, wildfires, things like that. So they're not unique to the property that your buyer is buying. All of them are important to review, but the ones that are specific about the property that your buyer is has the offer in on is uh, there's the TDS, the SPQ, and the prelim, and also um, an NHD report. So it's the, the hazard report. Uh, so those are the ones that are going to tell you the most uh, specific details about the property. Uh, so whenever we, all of those disclosures come in, they're going to get sent out to your, uh, to your buyers and 
and you uh, to sign them all through DocuSign. So the advice is encourage them to do this on a computer, not on their phone. It is a lot of documents to look through. It's a lot of signatures to do, and uh, it can be really tedious and kind of clunky to do it on uh, on a cell phone. Um, so just encourage them to do it on a computer. The other thing that they're going to be wanting to work on at this point is shopping for the homeowner's insurance. Uh, similar to shopping around for car insurance, you can call to um, several different companies, uh, Google them, look up uh, get diff- uh, compare rates, shop rates. And then towards the end of your inspection, uh, and physical contingency. So it varies uh, depending on when uh, what you wrote in the original offer. Um, it can the normal is it somewhere between seven and seventeen days. Uh, seventeen days is the standard one. Uh, but towards the end of that, once you have all of the inspection reports back, we've ha- had a chance to review all of the disclosures sent over from from the seller. Then that's when it comes into time for uh, negotiations, and the outcome of that is if. If the buyers are content with everything, uh, they will, you know, we don't have to negotiate everything. They can just say, I'm good to go. Let's, you know, let's drop the contingency. Uh, the other options are um, repair request, a price change and credit to buyer, which I will let Kevin talk about on how to handle, like what your strategy is there. Okay. So starting off with the AVID, the agent visual identification disclosure. One thing that was really strong taught to me early on in the process by a lawyer, and it's very important, you're not a specialist and no one expects you to be. So if you see cracks in the ceiling, don't say foundation issue. Don't say settlement. Don't say anything. Don't diagnose it. Only talk about symptoms. Crack in the ceiling, I write down crack in the ceiling, right? I'm not giving an explanation to why that crack is there. If I see mark on a wall, I'm writing mark on a wall. I'm not writing moisture, mold, damage, anything like that. Color stain on a wall, period. End of story. In terms of reviewing disclosures, I didn't put this out on note here, but I have had many clients who hold back on signing the disclosures because they believe it's a contingency removal, like they're agreeing to everything that's been disclosed. That is not the case. When the client and the buyer signs the disclosures, they are acknowledging receipt of the disclosures. They are not removing a contingency. There's a very clear distinction, and a lot of buyers are going to have confusion with that. So that's something that you need to know as an agent, because Jacqueline's probably going to bump you and say, hey, still waiting on those disclosures. And they're saying, well, I'm not ready to remove contingencies. You need to understand that the two are not correlated. No, when you're signing these, you're only acknowledging that you've received them, not that you're agreeing with everything you've seen. On to the request for repair. You usually do that at the physical contingency removal. Appraisal and loan contingencies not don't necessarily line up on the same day. The standard way to do it is a, a request for repair on the physical contingency removal. I would say 99 out of 100 times, it's best to submit on the last day possible. You can have a 17-day physical contingency and know that you're going to ask for 10 grand on day two. I'm waiting for day 17 almost every single time. And the reason being, if there was other offers on the table, I want to give them time to lose interest in the home. I want to give them time to go elsewhere and look at other things. Also, psychologically, the further you get into the contract, the further along the sellers feel. You know, they're already counting their money in the bank. They're already really kind of in this process. So take all the time you possibly can on those and deliver it on the last day because you're more likely to get the deal to go through if you hold it out to the very, very end. A lot of the times in negotiation, you'll see selling agents fight for shorter contingency windows on the physical contingency. That's exactly why. They don't want to be strung along. It's typically the best practice to ask for money off or a credit as opposed to work to be completed. Now, that's not to say that you can't ask for work to be completed. But when I say, hey, I want you to do X, Y, and Z to my, the seller, or if somebody says that to me, I'm not going with the best handyman to get it done. I'm going with the cheapest, period, because I don't care the quality that's done. I'm just checking a mark off the box. Boom, let's get it completed. And it also has a whole bunch of other layers of complication. It has to be proven that it was completed, all that kind of stuff. Nine times out of 10, 
you want to ask for money off for credit for those repairs and complete them yourselves, choose your own vendors, et cetera. Now, one-off situations where that might not be applicable, things like hot water heater is not strapped and we need that prior to closing. Hey, I'm asking that you, the appraiser wants the hot water heater strapped. I'm asking that you strap the hot water heater. Something simple like that, nice and easy. That's not a problem, but usually I want to ask for the money off rather than completing the work themselves. When you do your request for repair, that is the time you send all your supporting evidence. Every inspection you got, every invoice you got, everything, everything, everything. Now, let's say I found 50 grand worth of problems, but I'm okay with most of them and I'm only asking for 10 grand. I'm not only sending 10 grand of evidence, I'm sending 50 grand worth of evidence because everything you provide to the seller has to be disclosed to future buyers. So we're basically saying like, hey, look, I did my homework. I found all sorts of problems. Here you go. Every other buyer is gonna see all this thorough homework I did. Now work with me on this negotiation. When we're negotiating, changing, let's say we wanna take 10 grand off. The easiest option is changing price. Hey, I wanna go from 500,000 to 490. There's not going to be any problems with the underwriters. It's not going to flag anybody. It's the simplest, but it's not the best for everyone involved. Usually credit to the buyer is the best. The reason being is it means they have to come up with less money up front. So it's easier for them in the short term. Instead of their monthly payment being dil diluted by, let's say, $3, they get to save $15,000 up front. It's well worth it to them. But make sure to check with the lender before you ask for some crazy credit, because that might throw off your underwriting. If it's five grand, if it's three grand, it should be okay. If it's 20 grand, 25, 30, 40 grand, just send a friendly text to the lender. Hey, I'm planning on asking for a credit in this, in this amount. Is that something that's going to spook you? Another nice thing on the request for repair, if you're not asking for the work to be performed, you're not alerting the underwriter of any sort of problems at the house, right? So if I'm asking for 10 grand, I'm not gonna put all that in the report on the RR, I'm gonna send it in the email. Hey, I'm asking for 10 grand because you know this XYZ is broken and we want it fixed. But as far as the lender is concerned, you might just be squeezing them for a better deal. So you're not alerting the lender of problems and it's gonna save you headache in the future. Okay. So next up are your, the next two big contingencies are the appraisal and loan contingency. Just uh, reiterating, it's all happening at the same time. So um, it's not uncommon for several of these to fall on the same day. So, you know, if we, the contract by default says uh, 17 days for physical appraisal and loan. So if you just went with the way, if we wrote the offer just as a standard contract is, uh, all three of them would be uh, due on the same day. So for uh, the appraisal contingency, the lender is going to order it. When it is ordered, the appraiser is going to make a phone call to uh, the listing agent in order to set up the appointment to go out to the house. And it can take about 10 to 15 days to get it back. Uh, you can ask your lender uh, what the ETA is on getting that back. Sometimes they're able to get them in quicker. The way that the appraisal contingency is ready to be dropped is once uh, the appraisal is, uh, once the appraiser has gone out, done the report, sent it in, and that it has, uh, that the property has met value with no repairs required. The lender is who can tell us like, yep, we're good to actually drop uh, appraisal contingency. The loan contingency, so the lender getting it, uh, having all of the documents in, that they have done a rate lock, that they have gotten it through underwriting and all of the conditions are clear, uh, that they are actually like, that they're saying that we will make this loan, uh, that we've seen everything that we need to see. The lender is who gives that approval, uh, saying that they are fully approved and we are good to, to drop the loan contingency. There's one other contingency that has become more frequent uh, right now, and it is contingency of another property. And it is when uh, your buyer has a house you know, that they're currently own, that they need to sell that in order to buy this new one. Uh, so that'll be contingency of other property. If that comes up, uh, we'll work through that together. Um, it's just uh, syncing up some of the dates. And uh, what it means is in order for the contingency of other property is saying like, 
they are not going to be able to purchase this current home unless the previous one closes. So it just adds an extra contingency on there for us to uh, work with, but totally normal. A reminder to your buyers to buy nothing and they'll be getting really close to uh, the closing date at this point. And so they're probably getting really excited and looking at washers and dryers and refrigerators and couches tell them to sit tight. They're not done yet. So once all of their contingencies are dropped when the appraisal, the loan and the physical and other property, if they have it, are when they remove all of those, it's called um, a full CR. So once they sign that and we present it to the other side, at that point, their earnest money becomes hard. And so they won't be getting that earnest money back if for whatever reason they decided between the time that they drop all those contingencies at any point forward, they're either closing on that house and they're going to own it or they are going to lose their earnest money. It's not something to freak them out. Uh, it's just something to let them know, like, this is your final exit ramp. Uh, at this point, your money is becoming um, solid. So to just be really confident. <laughs> Appraisal contingency. It's definitely the weakest of all the three contingencies that are standard. You're also relying on a third party vendor. Not all appraisers are the same. In a situation where you think you might be tight, it's not a horrible idea to be present at the appraisal process. Tell them, oh yeah, we had to beat five other offers. Oh yeah, you know, oh, we weren't the highest offer, but we were the cleanest terms, stuff like that. There's a little bit of salesmanship that goes into that as well. A couple little notes for the appraisal contingency. Make sure your smoke detectors or carbon monoxide detectors are in place beforehand. The last thing you want to do is the appraiser to put in a, some weird little uh, thing. Hey, they weren't there. And it has requires you to either go take pictures or do it later or... God forbid, a revisit, pain in the ass. Make sure the hot water heater is strapped beforehand. Same situation, prevent extra work on yourself. If you don't agree with an appraisal, you do have options, right? Sometimes appraisals come in all over the place. Most of the time, it's just for the purchase price. It's clean and easy. But sometimes they come in and they appraise low. And if it's super low, you can dispute it. You can say like, what are you talking about? The one next door in the same condition, same, 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 sold for this much. How the hell did you come up with something so crazy? If disputing it doesn't work, you can always order a second appraisal. So you don't have to go with the appraise, the first and original appraisal. Know that there's back end around it. And third case scenario, let's say it appraised low, you tried to dispute it, you got a second appraiser, it's not gonna happen. You can always either A, renegotiate or bridge a difference. So if that purchase price was at 900, the appraisal came back at 875, you tried to fight it, still 875, you got a second appraisal, still 875. You can either A, say, hey, sellers, we need to purchase at 875 or walk away. Or the difference is they can bridge, the buyers can bridge the gap and they'll say, hey, I'll just pay that additional $25,000 to get us there. Higher appraisals are always better. It's rare. I would say maybe one out of every 10 appraisal comes back higher than the purchase price. I immediately like to congratulate my clients on making that much money that day. It's monopoly money. It's not in their bank account. They never realized it, but hey, I know we were scheduled to buy it at one nine, it appraised at 2 million. Congratulations on making a hundred grand this morning. Boom, you are gonna close that deal, period, period. So make sure to bring that to their attention. Loan contingencies, I encourage your clients to be as fast as possible and get in the lenders, their docs. There's nothing really else you can do to sway this. I mean, obviously you wanna stay in communication with the lending officer as much as possible, just to kind of stay on the same page. You guys are different, working on different things, but for the same goal. But realistically, some clients need a little kick in the pants to get their docs in. Really stress to them the importance of making sure that's all happening on time. The sale of another property contingency. Keep the other listing agent or the listing agent in your property up to date but always keep the uh, updates optimistic. Oh yeah, we had a really busy open house. So we're seeing some progress. I don't care if no, only one person showed up. Like talk to them frequently and be super positive about it because you got to keep their nerves calm too. 
Once all of your contingencies have dropped with the full CR, uh, then it is pending. So your file is pending. It can be a pretty quiet time on uh, your part as the agent during uh, during here uh, on the the logistics and the transaction side of it. There are there are some you know things that are happening of just putting the final touches on it with the lender and the title and coordinating appointments um, for closing and things like that. But on your end, it can feel a a little bit like a void of not really knowing, you know, what if you've been really busy with showing them properties and uh, writing offers and uh, going to inspections and you've been you know, constant communication. And then all of a sudden it's pending. And, you know, if it goes pending on day 17, but we're not closing until day 30, you know, that's two weeks of just, you know, it can just feel a little weird. So just to be aware of that and that it's normal, but still make sure you're, you know, communicating with your client, just touching base with them. The things that you can talk to talk with them about, the good points of contact is reminding them about uh, scheduling their movers and uh, setting up and canceling utilities for the new house as well as canceling the old ones. And they are going to need to schedule their closing appointment. The title company will typically do that. And just so you're aware, uh, it is fairly common now for the uh, to do a notary closing. So the title company will uh, schedule with a notary to send them to wherever your buyers are. So if they're at work or at home, they can just meet them wherever they are to get all of the forms uh, and uh, closing documents signed and then sent back uh, and the notary will take them back over to title or uh, overnight them to title. So just know that that's an option. One of the other things that you do, you'll do as you get to about five days before closing, uh, you're going to uh, schedule for your final walkthrough with your clients at that final walkthrough. So you want to do that fairly close to closing. You're just going to walk through. It should be after the current seller has moved out. They've gotten all of their things out of there. And then that way you can see the bones of the house and just make sure it is in the condition it was when you were touring it and getting the inspections on it. Sometimes, you know, occasionally things happen when movers are in there and damage can occur. So you're not going in there looking for new problems or problems that had already existed. Uh, You're not like, oh, I never noticed that before. What you're doing is making sure that like, a garage door didn't get broken, you know, while moving or while the movers were coming and going, um, that there's no new leaks, that there's no glass that was broken, things like that. Also, if there was any agreed upon items that are going to be staying in the house, if there's, you know, chandeliers that they talked about or patio furniture or furniture in the house that were agreed that that's going to be part of the sale, making sure that it's actually there. So just ensuring that the property is going to be handed over the way it has been discussed and agreed upon. So while you're there, there is a form. So you've done your AVID at the time of your inspections and you'll do the verification property, uh, verification of property form when you go and do your final walkthrough. On the verification of property form, it is, it's very simple. It is just like a text box saying like, it all looks good. It looks the way it's supposed to. Or if it doesn't, then you write in more things. Closing appointments. I always like to bump escrow to make sure they reach out to the clients directly. I don't want to be involved. So about a week out, hey, I want to make sure you schedule with my clients. That's also a good way to get pulse on where everything is without asking. Hey, make sure you want to schedule my clients. The client doesn't need to be in town. Jacqueline mentioned that, but a lot of people are concerned like, hey, well, I'll be on vacation. Cool. Doesn't matter. We can get a notary to you no matter where you are in the world. Making sure the clients have all their funds in one place about a week out, like make sure that the money is ready to launch and ready to wire is super important. VP, don't be afraid to be a bulldog on the verification of property. Honestly, this is your last call. This is your last chance to protect your clients. So once you close, too bad, so sad. There's nothing you can really do about it. Look for issues that were not there, uh, damage during move out. Obviously, Jacqueline talked about that. Don't be afraid to call out the listing agent. Hey, I'm here at the property and all the cabinets still have stuff in it. What are you doing with this stuff in the garage? Like, don't let that be your client's problem. Call the listing agent to get all that stuff squared away ahead of time. So this is like your last chance. Guys, I cannot stress the importance of a verification of property. One time I 
skipped the verification of property kind of, there was a squatter in the house. We literally showed up to give keys and there was a homeless dude living in the house that needed to be evicted. So just be aware of like, those are the things that you can be looking for too, just random things. Don't make that mistake. Let my mistake be the mistake that you learn from. Do the verification of property because it's going to protect you. Finishing strong. Jacqueline ca- talked about that gap, right? There is a dead time between the... Con- your job is essentially done once all contingencies are removed. You, you don't really have an active part of the process other than making sure the clients get keys. But people remember how you started and how you finished. That's what's going to leave the final impression. So that's why a lot of people really stress closing gifts, making impression, creating some sort of memory, doing something special at the key exchange. This is the time for you to leave the lasting impression on your clients that they will remember you forever. I like to encourage them to continue to reach out to me if they need help with any vendors, if they need help with the landscape or plumber, call me first because I want to stay in contact with them and I want them to feel like the service is continuing. This is also the time to ask for things, ask for reviews. Hey, review me on Zillow, review me on Google reviews, et cetera. This is all the time like, hey, if you like the service that I provided for you, if you ever meet anybody that's looking to buy or sell, please send them to me. That's how my my business works on word of mouth referrals. Like this is when you ask for those that kind of stuff. It's gonna help a lot. And occasionally, and I know this is a horrible thing to close off on, occasionally you're gonna have a pissed off buyer. It doesn't happen very often. I think everybody that's done any sort of real estate sales eventually ends off with a buyer that has some sort of buyer's remorse or pissed off client that can't be resolved. And that's just a reality of it. You can't fix everything. You can't always make everybody happy, but try your best to resolve it. And a lot of the times if there's any sort of rocks or bumps at the end, you can actually use it as a great example of why you're the best by smoothing it over at the very end and really confirming with them why they were so happy with your service in the long run. I did want to make a note on the mobile notaries. So Kevin said that they can get a mobile notary to you anywhere in the world. That is accurate. If they are outside of the country, it adds an additional layer. It's not a big deal if they are in Idaho, but if they if they're going down to Cabo or if they're going to be in England or wherever, it just adds an extra layer uh, and time of getting those documents back. Um, you know, just because they can't do electronic versions of those documents, they're going to need them to be like wet signed and uh, FedExed or overnighted back, and so it just takes time. So uh, if you know that your buyer are going to be out of the country, please give everybody a heads up, um, specifically me and title and, and the lender, everybody. And so closing time. So they have signed all of their documents, them signing their documents. That is not when they actually own the house yet. So there's several things that happen very quickly together, usually within the same day or within two days. They're going to sign all of those documents with the title company, and then they are going to get all the money in there, whether it's coming from the lender is sending a wire or uh, they're wiring in their own funds from their bank accounts. So all of the money needs to get in and sent to title. And then the title company is going to do, uh, they're going to record it with uh, California. And so once it is recorded is when it is, when they actually own the house. And so title will send out a note uh, or an email saying we're on record. And when it is on record, that's when they own the house. And then they can have keys. The only caveat to that being if part of the contract is that the current owner is going to be staying in the property. Sometimes we do, uh, it's called seller in possession. And it's just that they need a handful of days to make the logistics line up. uh, So then that way they can get moved into wherever they're moving and they needed it to close in order for that to happen. So that's the only time that it's it's a different scenario which we can uh, walk through and I'll, I'll answer any of your questions on it on uh, when those come up. But a lot of times they are getting the keys once it records. Um, and then that's when you would do what Kevin was talking about on if you want to do client gifts, uh, take your pictures for putting it on social media, congratulating them. It's a really big thing. It's really exciting. There we go. And then home sweet home. They own a house. <laughs>
and stay in touch with your clients. Follow up with them. Use your CRM. It's there for a reason. Make sure that, you know, six months don't go by and they haven't heard from you again or a year or two go by and that, you know, they don't know your name because more than likely they are going to want to sell at some point and move into something else or get a second home or any of the above. So make sure that they remember who you are. I have yeah. a um, it doesn't have to do with the slide directly. It's more with the, the offer type form. Um, what the holdout list? Holdout list on a listing agreement means that, let's say hypothetically, the seller is signing a listing agreement with you, but they had already pre-negotiated with their cousin Bobby to might buy the house, and they're not going to pay you if they're holding their hold out list of cousin Bobby. Basically I've agreed to let you sign it uh, and you're, I'm going to pay you if this house sells in six months, unless I sell it to my cousin, Bobby, who I'm already working with. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I had a question, um, like for the inspections, is it always the, the buyer who's doing it or is it unless the sellers haven't already done it? Yeah. So some sellers include inspections ahead of time. Sometimes the, those are good. You can take them at face value. Some buyers want to get their own inspections. Number one, not all inspectors are created the same. If the home has been on the market for an extended period of time, yeah, let's say six, eight months, maybe they're a little bit outdated and you want to get fresh inspections. The sellers will usually provide the, anything that they're going to provide on the very front end. Anything you want in addition to that would be the buyer's responsibility. Uh, in the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned communication between the escrow and the client. Is it only between them? Um, is that only does that only refer to the escrow company? Like anything from the listing agent, then I would. It's my responsibility, right? The listing agent should never talk to your client ever. They okay. only talk to you to talk to your client. Escrow is a third party, right? So escrow is a third party. I don't want to be in the middle of an escrow conversation with my clients. I don't want to have to, every time escrow needs something signed, I don't want them to come to me to go get it. Go to my clients, speak with them directly. Here's their phone number. Here's their email. Talk to them. So that happens in like the first 15 minutes of getting an offer accepted. Well, my offers expect, all right, please CC my team email on this, yada, yada, yada. And I send that to the other side, the listing agent. And then I immediately send Jacqueline and the escrow and everybody, hey, here's the contract. Here's the names of my buyers and here's their contact information. Coordinate CC Jacqueline on everything and please send the wire instructions directly to my clients. Like that kind of thing. Set clear expectations at the front end because we don't want to even be responsible for wire instructions. Wire fraud is a huge thing. I don't want to be given a fraudulent wire instruction from some random person, send it along to my clients on, on the wrong behalf. Next thing you know, my clients are wiring hundreds of thousands of dollars that I've, I told them to send that was completely wrong. I want none of that. Escrow send their own wire instructions to my clients. I don't want to get in between escrow and my clients. Okay. Thank you. And it is normal. Uh, the title company is, they're going to send, you'll have title companies send over the wire instructions to your buyer. Uh, just so if your buyer asks, it is perfectly normal. Uh, the title company will usually ask them to ask the buyer to call the title company to verify those uh, account numbers before wiring, like before hitting submit on that wire. So just several steps because it is a lot of money that they are, um, that they're moving around. Guys, this, this training today is more of a baseline so you get a general understanding of it. It's probably going to, the first time you have an escrow, you're going to need your hand held a lot. Do not be afraid to ask questions. Probably going to take you five to 10 escrows before you get comfortable with it. And it's super counterintuitive, but you'll realize as an agent, constantly emails are flying back and forth. And one thing you got to realize is what you actually should pay attention to. Because once you're in escrow, a lot of the stuff is not relevant to you at all, right? So there's a ton of irrelevant stuff happening all the time, and you'll eventually learn what you can just ignore, what's your responsibility and what's not. And this is really important. This little presentation is actually an important step of like, hey, what is actually relevant to you? There's not that much, but there's a whole lot more that goes on in the process. It's just going to have nothing to do with you.